So next one is the second one, or pa second part of the side glass dream team. That is uh, Justin, of Doug. <laughs> and uh, as I say, uh, something is special about Justin is that he's the only one of this class of intern that is a rising junior, not senior. And as you will, if you are someone that comes every year, you know that like we have very few rising juniors because it's just harder for them to make the cut out of the 100 applications, but actually Justin made it easily because he's not only a great student, but he's also full of energy and he's so driven that I knew he was the right pick for this project. So as he told me, like, I'm willing to clean floors, and no, we didn't make him clean floors, but he was challenged with this project, and so he's going to talk to you about what he did. Um, thank you, Ilaria. So good morning, everyone. My name is Justin Ricketts. Um, I'm a rising junior at Suncoast High School. I'm in the Math, Science, and Engineering and International Baccalaureate programs. And this summer, I had the opportunity to work with the Electron Microscopy Corps in using virtual reality for outreach and scientific analysis. So kind of just to recap what Doug just discussed, SciGlass is a virtual reality software created for the purpose of analyzing scientific data in 3D. So the main point to really drive home here is how viewing these images in VR is beneficial over previous 2D methods of imaging, of image analysis. So you can recall that microscopes, they take slices of images of a 3D object. And so previously programs such as image J, you need to view each of these slices individually. And the GIF on the left here kind of demonstrates that process and that you can kind of see each flash is a different image of another slice that a researcher would need to go in there and view individually and kind of use their imagination to reconstruct that 3D project um, accurately. So imagine having to try and trace a blood vessel or a dendrite that's moving up and down in different directions through that 3D space and you're only able to view one slice at a time, one 2D slice at a time. It can get pretty difficult pretty fast to get a very good, accurate, confident image of exactly what you're looking at. So we basically took these stacks of images and created 3D projects like the one you're viewing here on the right. And this allows researchers to easily view the structures they need to see as they are in real life and manipulate their data in ways that weren't previously possible and with an ease that wasn't previously possible. And it really allows them to use more tools like the coupling tool, which you're about to see me use in just a second. There it is. And what has been really cool about using this technology is that by having access to this, while it is so early in development, we have been kind of placed on what could be the forefront and what could be the future of um, scientific image analysis and become almost experts before most institutes even have their hands on this type of technology. So with that, let's kind of move on to what makes SciGlass so special, and that is SciGlass's tools. Um, SciGlass's tools are really the bread and butter of SciGlass and what makes it so unique and so cool. And you can see a diagram of all of them here. I won't cover all of them, um, but I will cover a few key ones and a few of the more useful ones that we found. So for starters, there is the transformation tool, um, which basically allows you to move your object through the 3D space. Um, it allows you to grow and shrink your object depending on what you need to look at. There's the cut plane tool, which allows you to cut into the surfaces of your project and view the inside and view the many different layers. Um, you saw me use it at the end of that last video, and Doug used it a few times in the videos on his slides. Um, next, we have the counting tool, which allows you to place dots onto your 3D project and count the number of certain structures there are. So you can think that could be used for counting the number of organelles, such as mitochondria in a cell, depending on what you're viewing. Then there's the tracing tool, which allows you to draw in lines and trace the path of certain structures through your region. So for example, you can trace the path of blood vessels or dendrites through your um, image. Then there's the measuring tool, which allows you to measure the distance between two points. So that can be used for measuring the length of a synaptic cleft, again, just as an example. And then there's the narration tool, which basically allows you, while you're in the virtual reality headset, to record both your voice and your actions to create interactive presentations and videos, like the one you see here. And so that segues kind of nice into one of our main goals with using SciGlass, which was to create interactive presentations that can be both educational and engaging. Um, so first, we created the video that you're watching right now, and as you're watching this video, you kind of have to keep in mind that this was a bit of a compromise and that you're viewing a video that's really meant to be watched in 3D, in virtual reality, to get that full experience on a 2D screen. 
So you're really not getting that immersive experience that makes Cyglass so cool. Um, so this presentation you're watching right now, we created it just to explain a few basic parts of the brain. And by doing it this way, viewers really get to view the structures in 3D as they are in real life and learn about these features in a much better way than they would if they just viewed a 2D image in a textbook but it also allows them to interact with the brain. And so this really makes learning a lot more interesting and a lot more effective. And these presentations can be used in a variety of places, including schools. So as I kind of touched on a minute ago, viewing these presentations through Cyglass also allows the actual viewer to interact with the presentation itself. So as you're watching right now, you can see me and Doug kind of picking up different surfaces, picking up different parts of the brain, moving them around. The actual viewer of the recording can do the exact same thing. So if they wanted to reach into the brain and pick up a part of it itself, it's gonna pause the narration, it'll allow them to play with it as much as they want, do whatever they need to do, and as soon as they've seen what they wanna see and study what they wanna study, they can go ahead and press play, and the narration will continue as normal. And so this is just one presentation that Doug and I created, explaining the different, um, explaining the different parts of the brain. Doug created one explaining the different imaging techniques that he touched on previously, and I made another one talking about the actual applications of Cyglass and how that can be used for research, and the contents of which are kind of spread out through the rest of the presentation. And so that kind of brings us to the second main goal we had with using Cyglass, which was using Cyglass for scientific analysis. And so this summer we had the amazing opportunity to take some images from ongoing research here at the Institute, which is from the photo you're viewing here on the left. So this photo is just one of 350 plus slices taken from a tree shoe brain with a two photon microscope. And so what's really cool about the images you're seeing here is that they were taken in vivo, which basically means the tree shoe was alive and active and doing its tree shoe thing while these images were taken. So back to this image specifically, when you're looking at this, it is extremely difficult to tell what exactly is happening. Um, what Jad, who was the researcher who gave us these samples, what Jad needed to find was possible points of synaptic contact. Um, so while you're viewing the images, you can kind of think of that where the red and green lines actually contact each other. So he needed to find possible points of synaptic contact. Um, and looking at this image, you really can't get a good idea of what's happening, where's the red lines, we don't know what we're looking at. So this next image comes from the middle of the stack, and it's a little clear, but it's still very hard to tell exactly what's happening. Um, so just an example, you can see right here the red and green lines crossing, and you might think of that as synaptic contact because they're touching, but you do have to keep in mind that you're viewing these images in 2D, so you're really missing that third dimension. So what you could be seeing here is that red axon could be far above that green dendrite, and you can't tell because you're only viewing this in two dimensions. So now this is a GIF of all of the 350 plus slices, but be honest, if you had to look at all 350 plus of these images one by one by itself, and after all that, you really still wouldn't be able to tell exactly what you're looking at with confidence and be able to confidently say, oh, this green is touching that red in all three dimensions. So this basically means that while using ImageJ, which is the scientific image analysis software that most scientists use here, it would be very time consuming and very difficult to tell exactly what's happening. And with that, you still wouldn't be able to say with confidence what you're seeing. And this all doesn't even factor in problems that arise from noise and color and empty space can cause in getting accurate analysis. So that's where Doug and I came in and we created this 3D project that you're viewing right now. So when we immediately loaded in the project and put on the 3D gla the VR glasses themselves, we were immediately able to kind of immerse ourselves in the sample in that 3D space and it greatly improved clarity right away. And so to achieve the goal of finding possible synapses, we decided to use the tracing tool to basically reconstruct this neuron in virtual reality. So that's what these white lines you're seeing right now are. Lines, they're lines that we went in and added manually using the tracing tool to trace the path of the dendrites throughout that 3D space. And by doing this, it really made it clear what was actually a structure and what was just noise and allows for possible points of synaptic contact to be predicted much easier. And so you see, I mentioned earlier how just because we saw red and green lines crossing doesn't mean they were actually touching. Now that we introduced that third dimension, we can see that that red line, that green line is actually close and that one's actually really far away. And so, um, and we also were able to tell exactly what was the structure and what was just, three, what was just noise in color and empty space. And so the main point to really drive home here and the point I wanna kinda of conclude on is that when you're using the 2D software, these tasks can be extremely difficult and time consuming. But when you put on the glasses, it makes things maybe not easy, but it can make things a lot easier and a lot clearer for researchers to tell exactly what they're looking at and be able to say it all with confidence. 
And so with that, I just want to do a few quick thank yous. I want to thank Naomi and Conan, who were our mentors down at the EM Corps this summer, for their amazing help and guidance, um, and everyone down at the EM Corps for all the images they gave us. Um, I want to thank Alaria for help making this program possible and supporting all of us through this um, endeavor. I want to thank Jad for these images that you saw on the previous two slices and giving us those samples. It was a really amazing opportunity to analyze those. I want to thank the other high school interns for making it such a fun environment to work in. Um, I want to thank the MP5 supporters for making this all this entire inter internship possible in the first place. And I want to thank all MPFI staff for making it such an amazing place to work in. Thank you. And so that I'll turn it to any questions. Any question for Justin? Larry knows I'm always good for a question. <laughs> uh, I've followed what's been going on here now for 10 years, and it's extraordinary. And what you've done with this project is extraordinary. Did this change your goals and objectives in your life? Because uh, you've got time to think about it. You're the, the youngest in the group in terms of educational as a junior. Uh, any changes you, you came to you? Yeah, so the question was, um, did this experience and did the research I did here kind of change the life path that I was thinking about and my goals? And honestly, it really did. I wasn't sure, so um, just kind of a little bit about like what I was thinking previous to the internship. I really thought I was going to go down that heavy medical path and um, pursue a career solely as a doctor. And kind of seeing research firsthand here has really made it clear to me that I do want research to be a big part of my career. And that's what has been really amazing about this experience. So yeah, definitely. Any other questions? Hi, thanks for the one. great talk. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, given the experience that you have with the Cyglass system now, and considering what the pandemic has basically done with all our socially distance um, and the learning that kind of goes into that, do you think that this could be used well as a collaborative tool with several different people possibly going in and you either teaching something or looking at the data at, this, at the same time and discussing, do you think that's something that could um, be useful? Yeah, so I'm really glad you asked that, actually. Um, the question was, could this um, software be used as a collaborative thing with the pandemics and that two people could be with kind of with the glasses and view it separately and collaborate in that way? And there's a really cool feature in Glass, which is the multiplayer mode, which basically allows two people, if they both have headsets, they can both go in independently and be viewing the same data at the same time at, from separate headsets and separate computers. And so that can definitely be used in the way that you're thinking in that people can be from separate places and be viewing the same sample and discussing it at the same time and viewing the same thing at the same time. Great job. Thank you.